Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's free training Thursday. I have with me here today Sam Saab, and he'll be taking us through security and user setup in Results CRM. As always, if you have any questions, please put them in the side panel, and we'll get to them at the end if we have time. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Sam, and he can take us through, the, through his presentation. Amanda, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for being on the call today. I appreciate you making time for this. All right, so today we're going to be uh, delving into the uh, security setup. Typically, we do this as part of the onboarding process where we do the administrative training for the person or persons responsible for your system, system and show you how to set up the, the various options for the users that are using the system for your office. And we're going to walk you through the whole thing today. So. Um, let me confirm a couple of things. So we're seeing the screen with the login. Okay, I'm gonna be using version 18, which is the uh, uh, current shipping version of Results CRM. Everything that we're covering though, really applies all the way to classic. So even if you're still using an older version of Results, there there's, has been no redesign, major redesign changes within the layout of the uh, setup screen and the options that you have there. So let's get in there and show you how to do it. When you log into the system, this is what we're talking about. Who are the users that are able to come into the system? And when they get into the system and log in using their user ID and password, what is it that they can do within the system itself? Now, the way these are set up, as uh, you can tell from the word setup, we're leading in to go into the menu called setup. Under the setup, there is an option here called users and security settings right there. Now, most entities within the, or most team members within the organization will not have access here. So if you click on this and it says, you need to be an administrator, uh, please don't be surprised, that's pretty typical. Usually there's one um, uh, and a backup. So typically two, maybe three tops would be the number of entities that are able to access the user maintenance screen. Let me describe what's in here and uh, then walk you through setting up a, a full user together. The, the way the maintenance screen works is that the far left side is the grid that shows the entities or the user accounts already set up in the system. Um, and so whenever you highlight any of those names, uh, you're gonna be able to see further details about that account or about that user. And we're gonna walk through all those options and explain what each of them are. Um, and also notice because the user screen has a lot of features or settings there, then there's also a tab section at the bottom where you're able to go to different portions of the setup. So if you want to set up team, sorry, timesheet uh, values or attributes for this user, you're going to go to the timesheet tab to, to identify those. Otherwise, by default, you'll be at the email tab. On the right side of the screen, uh, the, the most important uh, part of the uh, screen is this action menu. Um, some refer to it as an action bar, some of it's referred to as action menu. Effectively, these are the items or the steps that you're able to take at this stage. By, if you're not clear what the icon does, you're able to put your cursor on it for a couple of seconds, and then there will be a tooltip under it showing exactly what you are able to do uh, with that action button. Uh, the screen is in middle here, and the bottom right corner, there's the view mode, and then if you are highlighting uh, by clicking any field within the screen, further information about that field will be displayed within the status bar all the way on the bottom left corner of your screen. So it gives you a little bit more details on what you're dealing with. One final thing to show you or make sure that you're aware of uh, before we delve into adding a record, or a user to the system ourselves and, and uh, setting up the um, options is that this, there's a help button up here. Uh, this is your online help. This is equivalent to going and closing that screen, going to the help menu and clicking on this results help button. They both do exactly the same thing, except that in this case, you don't have to exit the screen to get to it. So when you click on this help, or press the F1 key, it will open up this online version of the help, which in other words, it's not a PDF file, it's actually an HTML or uh, online version, uh, um, technology, browser-based technology. And so if you scroll to the bottom of this list, you'll see something about setting up user accounts. And if you open that, you're gonna see different options here. One of them is called adding a user, which will walk you through all the options available 
including this important screen we're going to come back to later on. This is a chart that explains the security groups. I'll explain what security groups are. I'll explain the, this option and uh, remind you where you can go to see what the options are uh, without having to memorize any of this stuff. All right, let's go ahead and get in there and add a user together. Let's say we have a new person and uh, his name is Steve. They just added the team. Uh, that, that is now a new person uh, at the team. And so we're going to go here, go to the user maintenance. We're going to click on the add button, which is the first button at the top. And in this case, the naming convention here, this is a simple uh, sample data for a simple office. So everyone is sticking with first name as a user ID. Most companies will use the same user ID as used for the network ID. So it's typically first name, I'm sorry, first initial, last name. Some people will use a first name, period, last name. Some will use a first name and first initial of the last name. Whatever is the naming convention that is most applicable to you, it's usually um, a shorter version of the name. Um, and what you're, able, what you're limited to is that no more than 20 characters, alphanumeric is okay, no spaces are allowed, and you cannot use a single quote. Um, like for example, O'Malley uh, or apostrophe, the apostrophe is not allowed within the unique user ID. It's just a limited version of the name uh, by which the entity will be referred to when you're assigning record, assigning tasks, etc. So in this case, let's say this person is Steve Harper. And you'll notice uh, one too quickly here. So let me show you uh, this. Uh, when, you're, when you're first entering the name and you enter Steve and Harper, when you tab out to exit the field, as long as the full name is empty, whatever is here, if it's not uh, filled, when you leave the full name or when you're accessing the full name, it will automatically build it and substitute it with the first name, space, last name. So it's just saving you some time. Uh, the default security group when you're adding a new one is staff office, which is your most basic and regular security. Uh, no, nothing special about it. I'll explain what that means shortly. And then we also default for you the most typical options used with uh, for a new user, which is the ability to log in, this checkbox up here. The, the, the password is required and their ability to set their own password when they come in and the fact that the person will be listed in the available set of individuals or names that can be assigned tasks and contacts and documents and have a calendar within the system. Let's go ahead and hit uh, click on the save and at this point uh, we're done. Effectively that's all it took for adding a brand new user called Steve um, Harper and the unique user ID of Steve. Uh, to be a regular user within the results system. That's the most basic and minimal steps you need to set up the record. Now we can delve in and take more uh, or additional options or, or um, engage more options within what you're able to do for each of those records. So the first thing I wanted to touch on is the department field. Department field is optional but where it would be useful is that you'll be able to sort by it here on the left side and it will be easy for you to confirm that all entities within a certain department are there. The other area where a department is helpful, let's say these guys are in sales and marketing, the Steve we just added is in sales and marketing. So I'm going to go here and just add them to that. And let's say this as uh, here, there was another sample data is in the same department. So um, you're not required again to put it. You can you could leave it empty for those two. But here's the main advantage of also using departments. If you are in the calendar and you want to take a look at a certain team or the, the availability of a certain team, what you're able to do is you see this option up here in the top right where it says view users by department. If you click on this drop down <coughs> excuse me, and select sales and marketing, you'll notice that only the names of the entities in sales and marketing will be displayed. And so it's easier and quicker for you to be able to engage them all without having to worry about who's who and select the right name from the department. So this is a great way for you to quickly limit the calendar to that subset of data that's, uh, that you're looking for. Also, please remember uh, that the calendars and results, you can open up multiple calendars at the same time. So in a case like this, 
I can go open another calendar and maybe this calendar would be for finance and accounting. So notice my first calendar is still there. For those individuals, this calendar is there for just those individuals in other department. And yes, you can actually drag this out of here. And uh, this one also drag it out. You click on the tab name itself and then drag it push it away from the tab structure and now these guys can be um, seen side by side uh, or could be moved totally to another window if, or another screen if you have multiple screens open at the same time so uh, that's the main advantage of the department uh, other than the ability for you to confirm that the entities within the department are there based on sorting by this column up here so by default, we're sorted. We, we come in and the user list is by user ID. All right, so let's go back to Steve and, and walk through the different options. So we know the department can be adjusted if need be. Uh, the full name, the unique thing about the full name is that the full name would be exactly what will appear on the calendar. Uh, we're going to talk some, about an example later on of a conference room. And yes, you can schedule or, or deal with scheduling conference rooms, trucks, whatever other assets you might have in the office, you'll be able to um, set up a user. These are free users, they're called virtual user IDs. You're able to set those up to track the, uh, cal the calendar and the schedule of those various entities. All right, back to Steve Harper. So the, the full name is what appears on the calendar. The user ID is what appears on the dropdown when you're doing assignments. And we're gonna see some examples of that. Security group is extremely important. The default is staff office. If you click on the drop down, you'll see that there's a number of preset security groups that are available and you're able to assign different people to them. And so let's understand what the different ones are. Staff office is your regular user that can do typical office use. Next one up is staff financial. They're able to do everything staff office can do, but they can see financial data. Now this is gonna get not as easy to memorize and I don't want you to. So let's click on this help button, go to the, um, user accounts chapter and then within user accounts chapter adding users and when you scroll further down you're going to see this chart so this chart is basically saying and this doesn't have to be that right okay so this chart basically says these are the different security groups you'll notice staff office sitting up here the keywords there is fa for full access that means you can add edit delete uh, and then VO for view only. So the only one that really is for view only is guests. This would be ideal for an intern uh, that isn't trained on using the system or changing data in the system but can look up data or records. Uh, it could be for a temporary staff member that is answering the phone and can look up data again without changing anything. So that's a view only mode. Staff office can do full access to the contacts, calendar, documents, all the sales activities as well as project management. So effectively all the main screens in the system can be engaged other than financial data. Staff financial, which is the next uh, security group after staff office, able to do everything within the grid all the way to uh, invoicing payments and mass invoicing. So there they can now start deceiving these entities will see financial data while the staff office will not be able to access any invoices. The next one is management. They can do anything that staff office and financial can do. As you walk across visually, you'll see all the same FAs, but there's one additional FA full access option, which is the lookup table. So management can do everything financial can do plus manage lookup tables. And the final tier of security group capabilities would be under administrator. They can do anything that office financial and management can do plus the unique ability to manage the security setup. For the users all right so in this case um, you're going to be able to set all the options for this individual let's assume that steve is an administrator and you'll see why just to save us some time we're going to log out come back in and see what's going to happen to his account when he logged into the system so um, that's the minimal setup what i'm going to do is i'm going to exit the results system right now come back in and um, uh, basically show what is gonna happen once Steve Harper actually logs in. Note, uh, we kept all the defaults. He's able to log in with this check mark up here. He's gonna require a password, and because he's a brand new user, 
the prompting for a password is active. Notice there's no last login or last logout value because this person has never come into the system. He's brand new uh, to the results system. All right, let's exit from here. And now we're going to go back and log in as Steve. So the default coming in in uh, this system, I think, is set up for Mary. Yep. So just sample data, right? So in this case, I'm going to say I'm Steve. If I try to click on login to say, hey, you need a password. So okay, I'll select a password. Um, and the beauty here is that instead of you being burdened as an administrator by having to ask people to tell you their passwords, you can type it in for them. Most people are not comfortable doing that because many, statistically, many will use the same password for their bank, for their everything else, as well as they're getting into the system. And so they're not comfortable sharing that uh, password that they want to memorize. Uh, so what you're able to do in this case is have them check that box and have them set their own password. So this is how it goes. When you click on login, the system knows that this is a user that's going to set up a password. That that person just specified their password, and then all they have to do is enter that password uh, exactly the same. And so the system is confirming that that's the new password they want to use. Now, the reason I set this person up as a um, administrator is instead of having to exit and come back in, notice the top of the screen has us logged in as Steve, and yes, Steve can come in and access the user accounts without us having to exit and come back in to get to the user accounts. So if you go to the Steve, you'll notice two things changed on their user record. First, this checkbox about prompting is no longer active because they've already been prompted and they already set up the password. Now, if a person forgets their password or they want you want them to change their password, you'll go and check that box for them. The system will engage any password they enter as if it's a brand new one. The other thing to note is that now that the Steve has logged into the system, notice there's a there's a last login already there. This is the date of today's date and time. Uh, I'm on the East Coast, I'm sorry, West Coast today at headquarters. So you're, you're able to see all the information uh, as expected within the login. By the way, this data is also available if you scroll within the list of options or list of columns on the far left-hand side. The last login, last logout are summarized within this grid. So it's easy for um, a, a manager or administrator, because only administrators have, uh, can come into this uh, module to see who's in the office when they came in and whether they've logged out of the system or not. This last logout is going to help you keep an eye on that and know how to work with the uh, team members that are um, in the system, not logged out uh, overnight or something like that. Okay, let's walk through the additional options. So right now we finished the top section. We finished the login section on the on the top left corner. Let's go on to the web uh, the web access. On the web access, um, as you know, Results Web Mobile RWM is what it's called, or R4W is another key name for it or a, a nickname for it. So all of those are available if they're installed, if you have a server and you're able to install them, uh, you're able to then decide whether this person, Steve, is able to use the web version or not. You can still lock them out of the web version if you want, even if though it's installed for your office. In this case, we're going to allow them to log into the web version. If you're using field service management and only for field service management, there are special licenses that are used for technology for um, technicians in the field where there are subcontractors and they're not allowed to see the customer data. Um, so in that case, this is a less expensive license just for field technicians uh, and that are going to work in the field with limited access to the information about the accounts. Then you can actually check that box if you uh, are setting up Steve to be a field technician only. A field technician cannot log into the desktop version, cannot see customer data or uh, um, relationship data, and they're only limited to working the tickets that are assigned to them when they're out in the field, truly designed for subcontractors and part-timers. So in this case, we're going to keep this under web mobile. Let's move over to the right side and uh, see what the various options are. The first checkbox deals with a, a show me the name in the lookup table. Here's what this means, and this is very important. For people that are active, one thing you want to keep in the back of your mind, when you have an active user, an active employee that will be using the system, you will typically have this checkbox up here, 
this one, and this one checked. This one lets them into the system. This one shows them as an active user in the system. Everything else is options. So what does that mean? Let's go in here and let's pretend that we are uh, adding a new uh, user. So if I go to the ad for a contact record, notice how the system will automatically default. I remember I'm logged in as Steve. You can see that from the top middle of the screen in the top, uh, Steve between parentheses is the name of the current user. Then that is the name that will be assigned to. If you want to change that, you're able to click on the drop down and move around to the other names that are active and select a different name if you want to. So that's what we mean by I show them in the lookup table. This is the lookup table and you either list the name or you don't. Typically the ones that don't show up in the drop down are the inactive uh, staff members that are no longer with you or with your organization effectively. Okay, let's get back into setup users. Next selection is uh, rarely used, uh, but extremely powerful. And that's the one called the restricted user. This is the next one here, second one. Restricted user is typically uh, uh, limited to a subcontractor, a part-timer that's working with your organization. You brought them in, you know, in-season kind of work to, to add more resources to the team. You want to assign them a few projects to work on, but you don't want them to uh, um, go and take a look at your customer data and all over the, uh, you know, the, the various pieces of information. You want to restrict them to the account uh, that you want them to work on. It's like giving a person a few folders in there instead of access to the full filing cabinet. That's called a restricted user. So by design, anything that is set up as a restricted user, when that user logs into the system, the only accounts or contacts they're able to see are the contacts that they add themselves because by default when you add a record the assigned to is you and or uh, it have been, have been assigned have been selected as the assigned to uh, for records that are in the system so in that case you can see the contact record and all the related data activities documents invoices everything that you're allowed to see based on the security group that they are belonging to will be seen along with the contact record that they're assigned to, right? So that's a restricted user. And so effectively, they're blocked out of seeing the rest of the accounts. The next option is an override. This is an extremely powerful one, but it's typically restricted or limited to upper management or the ownership of the company. So an override ignore private flag means this person would be immune from, um, from being blocked of, uh, to see private data. In results, there are three types of records that can be private. A contact record can be set as private, a document record can have a private ownership, and a activity can also be set up as private. Private, one of those records, private, and being checked and the name of the assigned to would be the only person that can actually access that record. It's private record just for them, for their eyes only, except for the ones that are authorized to have an override. So let's say you're the owner of the business and the logic is you should not be able to be blocked from, uh, well, you would not want to be blocked from seeing any data in the system. All data should be accessible to you um, as an owner uh, of the business. Uh, there are also administrators sometimes that are set up with the override. The idea there is that if someone by mistake selects a record as private because they didn't know what they were doing and making that selection and hit save, that record will look as if it has been permanently purged or deleted, removed totally from the system, including all the data under it, like the activities on it, the invoices on it. All of those will disappear from the system. And so it's pretty significant and can concern the office. So the idea is to have the person with an override come in and look for the record and they'll be able to see it even if it's set as private and then remove the privacy. So that's what you would do on that checkbox.
Thank you. 